Uh, my name is Joe Goralek. I'm the president of the Dermatology Education Foundation. We want to thank everyone for joining us again this week for our weekly MPPA video webinar. Tonight, we will revisit our discussion uh, with our dermatologist lead thought leaders uh, from Florida and from Tennessee who've returned to work and, like many of us, are reading the daily literature updates related to COVID-19. And so this evening, we'll review some case studies and recent articles to learn more about the connection between COVID-19 infection and the field of dermatology. We're very happy to be joined and lucky to be joined again this evening by Dr. Brad Glick, who's the Pro Program Director of the Dermatology Residency at Larkin Community Hospital in Palm Springs, Florida, and the Director and Primary Investigator of GSI Clinical Research. He's also Clinical Instructor of Dermatology at Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine in Miami, Florida. Dr. Glick is a returning faculty member to the Derm 2020 NPPA CME conference that'll be happening live this August in Las Vegas, hopefully. And uh, Brad, thank you again for joining us this evening. Thanks, Joe. Please also welcome Dr. George Kehoe, a Knoxville-based dermatologist. He's also retur a returning Derm 2020 faculty member. We had a chance to speak to George at the end of April about the safety uh, changes he's made in his practice and his return to clinic in Tennessee. And so we're very lucky to have him join us again this evening to discuss some of the recent uh, literature in the COVID-19 dermatology world. George, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Joe. Couple housekeeping notes and then we'll jump right in to the uh, program this evening. It's important that to let you know, and we want to thank UCB for sponsoring part of this evening's program. UCB is inspired by patients, driven by science, and they're dedicated to developing innovative solutions for those living with and managing chronic conditions. UCB celebrates the dermatology, nurse practitioner, and physician assistant community who share in their commitment to advancing the discussion understanding and treatment of immunodermatological conditions, and they wanna to get to know nurse practitioners and physician assistants better. Like all of us here at the Dermatology Education Foundation, UCB is continually, continually learning and striving to partner and support with dermatology, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants in our community. If you wanna learn more about UCB, you can visit their website, ucb-usa.com, or you can email them at gettoknowus at ucb.com. We'll be posting those links on our blog page of our website at the conclusion of the program at dermnppa.org. Just go to the website and you'll be able to connect with them. So UCB, thank you for your support in helping us uh, with this webinar this evening. So we will post a summary of the references uh, and connections to UCB, as well as references to the articles that we'll be discussing this evening. So while everyone's muted during the call, please keep the questions coming to us. Throughout the call, please send in your questions to our host, Stacy Moore of Physician Resources via the, Ju the Zoom chat function or the Zoom group chat button on your screen. You can download the articles that we'll be discussing through the group chat as well. So you can have them in front of you as we go through them. And throughout the presentation, we'll be stopping frequently to answer these questions and have further discussion about the literature that we'll be reviewing. So let's jump right in. Our first article tonight <clears throat> is um, a case study. It's a prospective case study that um, just came out uh, last week, actually. Um, is very interesting and very pertinent to our world of dermatology in caring for patients that are on biologic medications. This is a prospective case study of COVID-19 infected patients or suspected COVID-19 infected patients that have immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. This case study is just really hot off the presses. Uh, you have it in front of you. Um, these patients were all treated with anti-cytokine biologics 
or immunomodulatory drugs or small molecules. You can see the diseases that they were affected by on the next slide. So this is really what makes this article relevant to dermatology. Um, these patients have psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, RA, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and ankylosing spondylitis. And in dermatology clinics, oftentimes these are comorbidities of our psoriasis patients or our patients with psoriatic disease. So what this prospective study was able to distill was that these patients coming into the hospital had exposure to biologic medications and or immunosuppressants. And they were able to tease out the comorbidities and look at the effect of biologics and small molecules and immunosuppressive agents on the patient's survivability. And what was determined, next slide please. What was determined very clearly was that whether patients were on biologic medications or small molecule medications, specifically JAKs, it didn't affect their ability to fight off or survive COVID-19. So our patients that we're currently treating with biologic medications and small molecules in our clinics, a common question from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic is, how are you managing this, these patients? And we did not have really any data to go from. This case study presents us with data that we can use that shows us in this population that by being treated with a biologic or a small molecule, their survivability or the effect of COVID-19 was not affected by their therapy. And so it's safe in this patient population to continue their medications as long as they're healthy. Next slide, please. So George, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, I know we've all been seeing some patients very limitedly in clinic and some by telemedic telemedicine. I know we've all been bombarded with phone calls by patients wanting to know if they can stay on their medications. And I think we decided that we look at our patients on a case by case basis. And as long as they're healthy, our advice is to continue their medications specific to biologics and small molecules. Uh, absolutely. You're right about the bombardment of questions. The phone calls came in from an incredible number of patients concerned about the biologic agents. Uh, this gives a recommendation at the time in accord with the American Academy of Dermatology was to continue as long as the patient is healthy. That was based upon maybe the feeling that withdrawing the biologic may have other adverse events on the patient and make it tougher trying to get the patient back on a biologic agent back to the point where they were prior to discontinuation. This study or this observation really gives great confidence. It's very easy. It's a, it's a you know, three-page handout you can give to the patient themselves if they're that concerned, saying we have some great confidence uh, in this correspondence in the New England Journal about continuing your medication. Although here in Tennessee, it seems to be things are on the recovery, patients are still very concerned. I have no doubt that several of my patients have stopped their medication, their biologics altogether. I, I know it's going to be uh, an issue when they return into clinic, but I know they've done it from the questions and kind of the way they pose it to me on the telephone or through our messaging system. But this gives great confidence in continuing patients on uh, biologic agents and small molecules. How about starting new patients as they present during this, these times? Are you uh, considering screening? Uh, I think that's a great idea. I think as testing becomes more available, you know, number one, checking uh, you know, the t PCR to see if they actually have it. And then later as antibody studies come out, this would be helpful, I think, a, a good tool, especially if the patients are very concerned about exposure, unsure if they've been sick. So I think it will help. And indeed, if this lingers on, they may, it may become part of the regular uh, testing that we do prior to initiation of biologic agents. Yeah, I, mean, may, I, I think you're right. I think that it'll end up being a part of our screening panel to initiate therapy, at least for the next couple of years before we get a vaccine. Exactly right. Dr. Glick. We're having a little audio glitch with Dr. Glick. 
Um, so let's um, yeah, and, move and on. Also in your in the, the article is reviewed too, more ambulatory patients, the patients that seem to be more healthy, more ambulatory patients were on biologics than those hospitalized. I think it's a 76% versus 50% ratio on those. So patients on biologics, looking at that, uh, greater percent ambulatory as opposed to uh, hospitalized. Yeah, no, I, I agree, George. I thought, I mean, it's interesting if you wanna you know, take that leap to say, well, maybe that cytokine storm that results in acute respiratory distress syndrome that leads to the demise and ventilation of patients, perhaps these anti-cytokine agents, the biologics in small molecules had some sort of beneficial effect. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be absolutely incredible. Uh, I, I'm sure studies are underway or ideas to get studies underway are being done. It's, uh, it's, an, it's an incredible uh, interplay at action there. Could these biologics be used well, against an infectious disease? Yes, and from the very beginning out of China, there were reports of one of the TNF-alpha agents being used as a therapeutic agent. I uh, haven't seen any reports about it then, but we can all do a literature search and see that there are several JAK inhibitors that are undergoing uh, study uh, as therapeutic agents. Indeed. But I'm really very happy uh, to present some of this information this evening. I'll go through it pretty quickly. Those of you who were on uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, saw that I presented a case of a 14-year-old um, who we suspect had um, some COVID-like cutaneous eruptions. If we can go to the next slide. So I put together this a little bit of agenda. We'll talk about that case and some of the emerging cutaneous manifestations of COVID-19. And, you know, as I go through uh, these couple of cases, it segues very nicely to uh, George's article. Uh, I was off on uh, the line for a couple of minutes there too. So George, I hope you haven't presented that yet. Um, uh, yeah. And then um, we're gonna uh, then shift after George talks. I, I wanna just uh, go over a couple of articles that I think are very interesting about um, some vascular compromise in patients uh, with COVID-19. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, and it's becoming very clear uh, with patients with COVID, uh, that there's clearly a, a severe uh, tissue hypoxia for these patients. And uh, we were just discussing earlier this evening some of the gastroenterological impacts that we're seeing in these patients. These patients are presenting uh, to ERs with cardiovascular disease, MIs, and, and so on. And then at the end, we'll, we'll review a very quickly another hydroxychloroquine article. Unfortunately, hydroxychloroquine isn't getting the very best of press lately, uh, but nevertheless, we will finish uh, with um, a promising study that's going to be done at um, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. Next slide. So uh, uh, Dr. Keogh will really talk about, you know, upcoming and kind of unique classification of uh, COVID dermatologic manifestations, but I just want to review the variety of what is being seen. More biliform eruptions, typical of viruses, even urticaria as well. Um, my case that I'm going to present in a couple minutes had EM-like eruptions, uh, varicella-like, so vesicular eruptions, uh, levito-like uh, appearances, drug-like reactions, toxic erythemas. Uh, in children, we're seeing these uh, Kawasaki-like manifestations, dengue-like pictures, um, another mosquito-borne virus type presentation, and of course, the well-known COVID toes, which we'll see in a couple moments. Next slide. Just a picture of COVID toes there too. Next click. So this is just a quick review. If you saw, if you were on a couple of weeks ago, this is a 14 year old, otherwise healthy, no meds, uh, no pertinent history, parent at home with COVID symptoms, cough, sore throat, with fever as well, tested uh, PCR, SARS, COVID-2, self-quarantined for a couple of weeks um, as this child was self-quarantined with uh, the family as well too. Uh, this patient was asymptomatic. Next click. We can click to the next slide, there you go. And this is, you can see the morbilliform erythema here in this patient, very typical of a viral process. Next slide. And these are gonna go into a um, series of clicks, there you go. And just a close up of, of one of the extremities. And if you'll click again, this, this patient had typical mobile form erythema, but almost what we're talking about these like dengue-like islands of sparing that you see on the upper extremity. 
And um, if you click again, you see some of the uh, distal dorsal toe has these kind of ill-defined, almost early chillbanes-like uh, appearance. And we kind of felt that these uh, might be COVID toes. Typically, they're a little bit more dusky than this. Next slide. See if you can click again. So just a summary for this patient, his rash, if you go back, the rash cleared in about five days, uh, really just some treatment with um, triamcinolone cream. Uh, I think the child may have taken some antihistamines uh, and so forth. Uh, the second case is a 16 year old. This is a newer case. I just saw this patient last week, 16 year old, uh, no past medical history, no specific exposure. Interesting though, that there are three adults, three children in the house, rather confined, close quarters, no one with no COVID, um, five day history of painful and pruritic eruptions, started on the hands and feet, spread to the truck and extremities, variable characteristics of the cutaneous lesions, as you'll see in a couple minutes, urticarial type lesions, PR type lesions, um, some oval macules, uh, erythema multiforme type lesions, very, very targetoid, and some lesions really on the, on the dorsal hands and feet. Patient did have a low grade fever, kind of a scratchy throat, no other symptoms. Otherwise look pretty well, certainly not toxic. Next slide. So see you here are the dorsal digits, uh, certainly some erythema, some of the dorsal distal digits that look a little bit dusty, at least they did to me. Some of the lesions look a little targetoid and you'll see a little bit of that on the palms. We saw some of those lesions elsewhere. Um, uh, some emphasis on the, the dorsal knuckle regions uh, bilaterally as well. More on the left side. Next slide. A little bit of patchy palmar erythema, a little bit of um, peeling. I'm not seeing it very, very well here too, but you should see again this dusky hue on some of the digits. Next slide. And again. Now this was interesting here. So when I say that there were lesions in, in different stages, this almost looked to me like a typical, you know, maculopapular viral exanthem. Next slide. Now here's where I started to think possibly COVID toes, these kind of perniosis or chillbanes type appearance. At least we see the dusky hue on the distal third and fourth dishes, also on the dorsal foot. Um, you know, not classical COVID toes per se, but I was really thinking potentially that this might be COVID related. Next slide. And next slides. So, you know, one of the things we'll talk about in just a couple of seconds is that as, as we have an index of suspicion for these patients, we should certainly biopsy these are our options. So I biopsy the, the uh, dorsal foot by the toes. And if you'll click on uh, several times here, just three times, uh, the first slide, you'll see a kind of a, a low power view with some a perivascular lymphocytic infiltration. Um, there are some extravasated uh, red cells, as you can see to the right. Also, if you look, you can see that there are some nuclear dusk or leukocytoclasia. And so our histopathology colleague thought that this might be um, a, a vasculitis, uh, possibly an urticarial vasculitis. If you look to the, to the right, there are certainly some eosinophils there. Um, so it's just very, very interesting. We're able to kind of put this together with some of our patients. You know, perhaps this is COVID related and that's the panel ultimate question. Next slide, please. And this is just the histopathology as I just described to you. Next slide. Next slide. So the question, are these findings secondary to COVID-19? I think our antennas are certainly up a lot right now. Um, were those COVID toes? Not really sure. I can tell you that um, if you'll go to the next slide. Next slide. So what is perniosis? And, and again, Dr. Keogh will allude to some of this as he goes through some of the classifications, but perniosis is often cold-induced, cold um, usually um, uh, inflammatory. We often will see it in some autoimmune diseases uh, like lupus. You know, what the, the pathophysiology is just yet, we're not exactly sure. Uh, certainly some of the sicker patients that have these acral ischemic type changes are much sicker patients and they have these potentially hypercoagulable states. Next slide. How do we treat COVID toes? How would we treat a lot of these inflammatory uh, disorders that we're seeing associated with COVID-19 topical corticosteroids? In this particular case with COVID toes, keep the, the, the feet warm. Um, there may be a role for aspirin. I think in our sicker patients right now that have these more acral ischemic type changes, uh, it's becoming clear that these patients are being uh, anticoagulated, anticoagulated. And you know, most of these cases are self-limiting. Next slide. 
In terms of follow-up, and again, I just saw this patient this last week. I haven't seen him back yet. I'm seeing him next week. We treated him initially with beta-methasone dipropionate cream, gave him an uh, IM injection of Kenalog, emollients. Um, I did recommend a testing. Actually, the patient did get swab tested and is negative as of yesterday. Uh, serologies and other labs are, are pending. Uh, patients' uh, parents tried to uh, bring the child to a lab. No one wanted to draw his blood until he was COVID negative. Uh, not surprising. And, you know, we're hearing this happen a lot. Um, so, you know, more to update at some other time. I know I went through that quickly. Next slide. And so I think this just last summary slide just basically indicates that we need to biopsy these suspected patients. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll continue to elucidate further information uh, about these patients presenting with suspected cutaneous manifestations of COVID. And once again, sorry for the technical difficulties and I'll segue right into Dr. Keo. Thank you so much. Very good, thank you. Uh... This is a brand spanking new article. Uh, as I said for publication by the British Journal of Dermatology on the 29th of April, it has not yet been proofed uh, or put into regular print, but right now just a more of an internet release. If you read through it, you might find a couple of, uh, you know, maybe typos in it, but again, that's prior to publication. It's a great article out of Spain, uh, looking at 375 cases in a nationwide consensus study performed by dermatologists in Spain. They were interested in this study because reports out of Italy showed about 20% of patients with COVID-19 had cutaneous manifestations, but they were not really well-defined nor classified, which made it kind of maddening trying to figure this out. As Dr. Glick mentioned, is, are, are, are we seeing manifestations of, of COVID-19? Are we seeing cases unrelated to it? Uh, so they really uh, did a nationwide effort among dermatologists over a two-week period, intensive two-week period, for patients with suspected or proven COVID-19 uh, and, and also with eruptions of recent, recent onset with no explanation of why the patients have had uh, th these rashes appear. They took photographs and then these were reviewed by a panel of four dermatologists without knowing the, make sure, without knowing uh, the reason for the study, which is interesting. You can go to the next slide. The five clinical patterns they uncovered are listed here. Acral erythema, vesicular type lesions, urticarial lesions, macular papeter, and lipidonecrosis. And in Dr. Glick's presentation, it, it, these really jumped out at me. Uh, he's, he, those are great cases that he has, uh, and the photographs are tremendous. You can go to the, now I'll, I'll go through each of these, but showing a cutaneous pattern which ones are dominant. You can see almost half of the cases uh, were macular papular. Uh, then you see smaller percentages, April erythema, 19%, vesicular at 9%, uh, urticarial 19 and lividonecrosis at about 6%. Uh, this, so this is the breakdown of what they have seen. You can go to the next slide. I'll hold it there. Uh, I wanna describe those five types. Let me go back, sorry, back up one, please. We'll go through these. Uh, acral erythema edema, that resembles chillblains. And we saw Dr. Glick's presentation of patients with these acral uh, erythematous edematous chillbane like lesions. They can be on the hands and feet, uh, usually asymmetric. Both feet do not have to be involved, both hands not be involved to the same degree. It can be asymmetric. The vesicular lesions represent about 9% of cases, uh, do show vesicles, but they're small monomorphic vesicles. Uh, not the polymorphic that you'll see in chicken pox with uh, vesicles of various size. These are more monomorphic. When I think monomorphic vesicles or lesions, I think about steroid acne. Steroid acne lesions are, uh, let me sure, make sure that I'm hearing this. There you go. Uh, the monomorphic lesions are more like steroid acne in that they're all about the same size. Going back, urticarial lesions, and some of those on the trunk that Dr. Glick showed appear a little bit urticarial. They can be truncal, dispersed, and some even palmar, which can make it very confusing with erythema multiforme. The uh, fourth type, the macular papular, representing the majority of lesions, uh, there's some perifollicular involvement on occasion, varying scale amounts. And this makes it look like pterosis rosea, and some of these lesions even become a little bit purpuric. Uh, the hand dorsum can have pseudo vesicles resembling erythema elevat and diutinum, 
or even erythema multiforme. Macular papular seems to be almost a big tent to throw a lot of rashes into. But remember, it's, it is flat and also papular, macular papular. And lipidonecrosis representing the smallest percentage of cases seen, lesions more suggestive of occlusive vascular disease, including areas on the trunk uh, and, and areas with acral uh, ischemia. You can go on to the next slide. Back up one. The first type, again, acral erythema, chilblains type. These are the characteristics seen in these patients. As a whole, younger patients with a mean duration of lesions. to the ICU and fewer deaths in these patients. 30% of these 30% of these patients, so I'm getting unstable. About 30% of these patients had itch and about the same percent had pain in these lesions. Patients with chilblains will complain of pain in the in the feet very often. So it's consistent with that. For COVID-19, that's the lowest of all groups uh, with skin lesions. You go on to the next slide. Um we may have lost Dr. Kiev. So um, do, let's pick up the, let's go back one slide, please. So I'll pick up where Dr. Kiev left off as we're um, on the vascular lesion characteristics. And again, these are, um, this is data out of Spain that was recently collected in Spain is a little bit ahead of us. All of this is pertinent to us in dermatology because this may represent the lesions that we'll see on our patients presenting to us as we re-engage in clinic. So the vascular lesions had uh, generally middle-aged patients. They came and went in about 10 days. Oftentimes they were the primary symptom before other COVID symptoms. Uh, these patients generally had disease of medium severity, not requiring hospitalization. They had almost 70% of them that had itch. Next slide, please. So this represents the greatest number of cases that presented in the Spanish population that was studied. Uh, these patients came in with the maculopapular and urticarial eruptions. Uh, these similar patterns um, associated findings in middle-aged patients. The mean duration was around seven days. And this particular eruption coincided more with uh, testing positive for COVID. Again, uh, you can see um, a high percentage of patients had itch with the urticaria as we would expect uh, with the maculopapular population having about two thirds of the patients experiencing itch as well. So relevance to dermatology uh, is very clear in these particular presentations. Next slide, please. So this is the smallest population of uh, uh, specific morphology that was described with only 6% seen in older patients lasting about 10 days. The interesting thing is that these, this was seen more in patients with more advanced or severe disease with a higher percentage of mortality. So this would really be something that would be a red flag uh, for us in clinic. Hopefully these are findings that were found mostly in the hospital-based population. So Joe, I'm here and, um, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this article oh, for sure. Um, you know, the, these levito patterns, very interesting in the JAD, you know, I talked about this last time um, when we were on, that the article, the, some of the early cases published in the JAD, you know, those patients uh, had kind of very mild presentations. They occurred out of, I think, as I recall, being outside, one in particular patient was outside and the warmth went back into the cool and then suddenly uh, developed a pretty transient levito pattern. And I think there's a little bit of a difference in separation between libido and, and true acral ischemia. And these acral ischemias with pre-necrotic and necrotic changes, mostly on digital di digits, I mean, we really have seen in a number of the patients that are critically ill. So, you know, I think there's a spectrum there. And of course, uh, we're learning more and more each day. Uh, this particular uh, study, the New England Journal of Medicine is putting out these really wonderful uh, brief correspondences, reporting cases as they come day to day. You know, we look at literature that comes on a particular subject matter. I mean, this is just pouring out every day. It's, it's remarkable. And I, I found this 
quite unique and, and pertinent, important as we look at these five patients. So if we go to the next slide. So in this particular study, this um, evaluation, we can go back one, please. Uh, there were five patients that presented to a New York center with signs of stroke. If we can go back one more, because it's really important the slide. And the one that I'll highlight, these five cases, they're similar in that these patients all presented with various, various degrees of large vessel strokes. And the age ranges, as you can see here, were 33 to 49 years old. Now, as a general comment, what's highlighted in the article that's really important is that in a New York center, on average, in a year, they might get one or two large vessel stroke patients that are under the age of 50. Here, they had five in under two weeks. So something very unique, something you know, quite remarkable about this virus that creates hypercoagulable states, uh, states these you know, vasculospasmodic type phenomenon. So if you look at our 33-year-old female, um, she didn't really have any uh, past medical history. If you look at her NIH uh, stroke score, it's 19. That's usually zero to 42. Anything in that 12, 13, 14, 15 and higher um, is severe and impending stroke. Um, hemiplegia almost right away uh, within days after uh, developing symptoms of COVID. And not all of these patients had symptoms of COVID, Joe. Um, it's, you know, extremely interesting if you look at the characteristics uh, across from left to right here. Uh, these patients end up uh, requiring substantial imaging. Some of them needed procedures. For instance, this particular patient had a pretty large clot, clot in her internal uh, carotid artery on the right and also her uh, right middle cerebral artery. It's not there, but if you look at the entire article, it's there. And initially she was put on an antiplatelet therapy and then ultimately on um, a, an anticoagulant as you uh, see there, Pixaban. I think, so, um, and, Dr. Glick, I think- Yes, sir. What so remarkable about this article and so concerning about this article was that this was a presenting sim these were presenting symptoms of disease for this group. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, not exactly in all the patients, but certainly almost right away, um, because they, you know, like, for instance, this particular patient that presented with some COVID type symptoms, at least initially, and then boom. The, the thing about it, what we talked about early on, two months ago, we were focused on this is a respiratory disease. Yeah. We weren't talking so much about GI disease. We were talking about this being a respiratory disease. Stories of patients literally looking pretty good, and within a matter of minutes, they crashed and they had respiratory illness. But to your point, these are patients that come in, and the dramatic degree of symptoms are not the respiratory symptoms. There may be no respiratory symptoms. If you look at patient number four, the patient presented with initially with just some lethargy and then crashed with profound neurological symptoms. And as, as I said before to this NIH stroke score uh, in that you know, high range. So incredibly remarkable. And these patients can crash very quickly, cerebrovascularly, as we know already, cardiovascularly, cardiovascularly, many have presented with MIs and some certainly have developed MIs while they're in the hospital. And I see, think it's along that same theme. Go to the next slide. We can just move to that next slide would be great. There you go. Uh, go, go back one. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to point out, you know, basically some of the other uh, characteristic uh, coagulation factors were not that substantially uh, elevated. What is unique here, if you look, um, some of the patients had substantially elevated D-dimers. And so I, I find that interesting too, because these we see in patients with hypercoagulable states. They have myocardial infarctions. They also have pulmonary thromboembolic disease. So there is something incredibly unique about this particular agent that creates a hypercoagulable state. Um, it may have to do with that, you know, that ACE complex where the virus is presenting because that has a, uh, uh, an injury, if you will, to the vascular endothelial uh, our region of our vasculature. So again, still being elucidated, but, but incredibly interesting. Next slide. Let's keep going. I think there's a, uh, another article here that I wanted to talk about, Joe, if that's okay with you. Yeah, let's move on. Looks good. Yeah, let's keep going here. So, you know, 
I almost want to kid a little bit, Joe, and say poor hydroxychloroquine. Um, you know, there's been some you know negative press about hydroxychloroquine. The story will end in a positive story because I'm a very positive guy and I like to keep things positive. But this is a really large <laughs> observational study of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. This is at the Columbia Presbyterian uh, Medical Center in New York City. Next slide. What's important about this article to everyone out there is that, you know, when we started talking about hydroxychloroquine, it was being promoted as a unique therapy, not approved at least initially by the FDA, even for compassionate use. Um, the studies that we were, we, were, we were gleaning information were very tiny studies, like the original study out of France, I think it was 26 patients, very tiny. And, and those for, were for reasonably critically ill patients, so it was as a last-ditch effort, and the data looked pretty good. This particular study was really put together, it was over 1,400 patients, to basically look at two, two endpoints. And the two endpoints were the requirement of mechanical intubation and mechanical ventilation or death. Uh, now in the study, some of the exclusions, and there were 70 individuals in over 1,400 that were excluded, uh, 26 were intubated before the study baseline, 28 were intubated and died before the study, three died before the study baseline and 13 were transferred to another facility. And basically the time point of the commencement of the study had to be after the first 24 hours upon entry uh, into the emergency room. And really that's basically what this slide indicates. Next slide. We can go ahead to the next slide. So basically what we looked at in this study um, was a group of individuals receiving hydroxychloroquine initially at a pretty high dose of uh, 600 milligrams. Uh, and uh, that's actually times two. So 1200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, a rather, rather profound dose of hydroxychloroquine um, followed by 400 milligrams once daily for another five days versus another group of individuals not receiving any hydroxychloroquine at all. Now this shows very small. You can click the slide again. Uh, whoever's advancing the slides. And this was really just to show you the characteristics of all the individual in the trial that were rather similar. I will share with you that one of the confounding factors in the study was simply that, ironically, the hydroxychloroquine patients were a little bit sicker than those not receiving hydroxychloroquine, which could be a little bit of a study bias. But this study uh, evaluation was really a very strict multivariant analysis. And basically what that means is for pretty much all the confounding factors, such as the comorbidities of all the patients, and you'll see the unique uh, therapies that many of these patients that as they became sick, they were put on hydroxychloroquine, they ended up on a number of systemic therapies, uh, antivirus like remdesivir and an interleukin-6 inhibitor such as um, uh, sarilimumab and, and several others. These were all adjusted accordingly in the multivariate analysis. And so that's very, very important when we interpret the data. Let's go on to the next slide. So if we look at the associations between hydroxychloroquine use and the composite endpoint, as I mentioned in the beginning of intubation or death, we can look at a crude analysis, a multivariate analysis, and a propensity score analysis. And we look at multivariable and propensity score analyses uh, these are rather stringent in that they exclude the overwhelming confounding factors. We really haven't seen this with a large-scale trial with hydroxychloroquine. So the question is, was there a benefit? Was there a difference with the use of hydroxychloroquine in these critically ill patients? Did it make a shorter time to intubation? Uh, did it create a blockade to death? And if you head down to the bottom of the slide, which is the most important, looking at the propensity score analyses, the hazard rate ratios within 95% confidence. If you look at with inverse probability weighting or with matching and adjustment for what are called propensity scores, you see the numbers are low, the hazard ratios are right around one, meaning there was really no difference whether you were on hydroxychloroquine or not. So it doesn't make a difference. Somewhat, unfortunately, another failure for hydroxychloroquine, but the story isn't over completely with hydroxychloroquine just yet. Next slide. And this is just another view, if you will, of the freedom from the composite endpoint. Was there a difference between these two avenues of 
hydroxychloroquine versus not. And if you look at these shaded areas, those are the 95% confidence intervals. And you see these lines are very, very close together. So over the time point, which in this study was about 23 days, there was really no difference from the use of hydroxychloroquine down the road. Next slide. So one thing I wanted to say before I close talking about poor hydroxychloroquine is there is some potentially good news for this drug, and that's the WIP study or the WIP COVID-19 study, which is being uh, performed. And actually, they're enrolling as we speak in this month of May at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. And basically, the WIP study refers to will hydroxychloroquine impede or prevent COVID-19? A very neat, neat trial. They're going to uh, enroll about 3,000 uh, individuals who work in the healthcare field involved in, I think it's five centers within the uh, Detroit um, municipalities and the Henry Ford Health System. I think it is five institutions. And they're going to really be going after looking at whether frontline workers can prevent the development or minimize the development of COVID-19. There'll be three arms in the trial. Uh, there'll be a, they're all going to be taking a one pill daily. There'll be one placebo arm, one 200 milligrams once daily, and then the other arm will be 400 milligrams once per week. So those individuals are going to receive, you know, one singular 400 milligram tablet, and then they'll have placebos on the rest of the day because this is a completely uh, blinded trial. So the investigators are, are uh, blinded and so will be the uh, study subjects. So with that, Joe, I'll close. There is some potentially good news for hydroxychloroquine. And I think it's become clear because anecdotally, we've really heard that uh, hydroxychloroquine in the community has helped many individuals. But, but I, I think it's becoming clear that it is not an agent for critically ill individuals. Yeah, I, thank you, Dr. Glick. That was, you, you very eloquently described complicated statistical analysis that gave us you know, really clear data that if you're critically ill, this is not a drug uh, that's going to save your life. And uh, as you suggested, is there a role? Maybe there is a role. I think the Henry Ford study is very intriguing and it'll answer the questions that are out there. You know, what is the role, if there is a role, for hydroxychloroquine? Chlor chloroquine, is it, do we have a prophylactic opportunity? And if we do, what's the dosing? And the negatives that are associated with high dose hydroxychloroquine that we saw in these studies, is that dosage related? Is it comorbidity related to a sick population with comorbidities that are critically ill? Um, and are we gonna see that at lower dosages that when patients are treated prophylactically or maybe with lower dosages at a very early uh, intervention uh, somewhere down the line in the disease process? Yeah, I think the dosing is extremely important. And it's ironic in the trial that we reviewed a couple of minutes ago, you know, 1200 milligrams uh, initial day, it's, that's, that's a big blast of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, fortunately, you know, while patients can develop cardiovascular abnormalities, you know, typically a lot of the reported cardiovascular abnormalities have been with uh, hydroxychloroquine used in conjunction with azithromycin, where we concerned about this uh, QT prolongation, cardio, uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. But the other really not spoken about the consequence of hydroxychloroquine uh, for getting retinopathy, which is with long-term use, is really yeah. the GI complications of which many patients have experienced that uh, as we've been using an abundance of hydroxychloroquine in COVID patients. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Uh, Dr. Keogh, are you still with us? I, yes, got back in. Sorry about the you know, drop out there. Uh, George, I missed you. Oh my God, <laughs> thanks. Uh, mentioning the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, there's another study that dropped out on the net about six days ago, not yet published. It's out of NYU. The primary author is Dr. Carlucci, C-A-R-L-U-C-C-I. We're adding zinc into the mix. Uh, um, so zinc or no zinc in addition to hydroxychloroquine uh, and azithromycin. And a 40-word summary, since we're running out of time, from their article, which is undergoing peer review right now, is that Zinc sulfate added to hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin may improve outcomes among hospitalized patients. So that's the 40 word summary on that one. Uh, but it's available, uh, Dr. Carlucci, C A R L U C C I, out of NYU, uh, Langone Health, and Grossman School of Medicine. Well, 
the good news is more studies are being done. We'll have more uh, data to talk about in our upcoming video series. And uh, the, the fluidity and the, the nature of this uh, information coming out in the age of the internet is absolutely incredible. Dr. Glick and I uh, briefly spoke about the uh, AIDS epidemic and other uh, epidemics that have afflicted uh, the United States and other countries and how slow the dissemination of information was and how things would be chronicled once uh, a condition had been um, somehow contained. Yet with this epidemic, things are changing momentarily and we're getting data updates momentarily. And so by sharing information as this pandemic goes from country to country and now we're here in the United States, state to state, hopefully soon we'll have a better idea of how to mitigate it. And then when we do, or if we are to get sick, hopefully we'll have an early intervention that'll mitigate the disease for the next uh, time until we get a vaccine. So I want to thank again UCB for sponsoring a portion of tonight's program. Uh, please take time to visit their website at ucb-usa.com or email them at gettoknowus at ucb.com. We're going to continue to host these weekly video series uh, with less, uh, hopefully less internet glitches next time, but more internet keyho and more internet glicks. That's the <laughs> so, you know, please email us at info at dermnppa.org with topics of interest. We'll get them uh, included in our agenda and look forward to visiting with everyone again next week on our website, dermnppa.org. Located on the blog page, you'll find the resources for the articles that we discussed tonight. So please, I hope, uh, I want to say again, thank you, Dr. Glick. Thank you, Dr. Kehoe, uh, for presenting, helping us learn more about how COVID-19 uh, pandemic affects us, uh, not just as humans, but also in our clinics with dermatology patients so we can maximize the care that we give to them. So please stay healthy uh, and stay safe. And uh, from the Dermatology Education Foundation, thank you again. We'll see everyone next week. Good night.